Hello, I'm the Angry Spork. Adapting comics to other mediums can already be tricky when trying to closely emulate the source material while at the same time making it accessible to a modern audience. More so when they decide to go in an unexpected direction. For example, X-Men Evolution. In the early 2000s, Kids WB, the block of youth-aimed animation, debuted a series about familiar-looking mutants, but most of them de-aged to attend public high school and use their powers in secret to help others while dealing with the trials of adolescence. The first season was a tad shaky, with some real cornball dialogue, sappy moments, or that time they re-ran the first appearance of Kitty Pride three times in a month. But by season two, the show hit its stride, and for all the deviations they made, became much more engaging. And it's where we got the introduction of a fan-favorite character. That's right, X-23. And as is so often the case, there was a tie-in comic for the show, albeit short-lived. I'm taking issue with the first three installments of X-Men Evolution, the only ones that take place before the start of the series. So let's see if these comics make us want to turn the page, or turn our heads. The first cover is really nice, the entire Season 1 team on display. Rogue, Storm, Kitty, Nightcrawler, and Jean, Cyclops, Spike, who, if you didn't know, was another show original character, as well as Storm's nephew. There's also Wolverine, who looks like he's in the middle of a yawn, Professor X way in the background, and an enormous Magneto looming over them. I'm, I'm a, a big, big mutant, mutant and, and I want, want a, a big, big cereal. cereal! Written by Devin Grayson, with art by Udon, Long Vo, Charles Park, and Sokka of Studio X, not to be confused with Sokka from Avatar The Last Airbender or Shaka when the walls fell. We begin with Logan, shirtless and passed out in the snowy woods. That's right, he finally landed the Harrisburg account. A couple hunters find him and become wary when they see those long metal things protruding from his hands. We then jump to a university, where a young woman named Monica walks up to Professor Charles Xavier, asking a kinda dorky question about his advanced genetics lecture, how human evolution is still, like, totally evolving, and if her hair going from blonde to brown as she grew up makes her a freak. No, no, my dear, that doesn't make you a freak. Being a college student with a floral pattern trapa keeper, now that makes you a freak. A car crashes into a tree nearby and almost immediately catches fire, with onlookers fearing it's about to explode. Not Aurora Monroe, however, as she casually strolls up and, after failing to open the driver's side door, summons a very precise rain cloud to extinguish the flames. I thank God every day I didn't get exploded. She assures the driver he'll be fine, and he should wait until help arrives. He'll be less fine when they find the empty whiskey bottles in the back seat and the mascot performer from their rival college in full costume, unconscious and stuffed in the trunk. She gets swarmed by the nearby students, amazed how she did that, one of them apparently recognizing her from chemistry class, so she flies away. Maybe she flew away because she thought he was hitting on her, you know, we have chemistry together, and she refuses to date a guy that wears a beanie. That night, Charles approaches her, revealing his telepathic abilities and elaborating that he thinks it's due to a mutation in his DNA, though it strangely reads my DNA or Midna, so whoopsie from the editors. He suggests that same mutation gave her weather control. In Tanzania, I am considered a goddess. Here, I am just an eccentric graduate student. Her deity status is probably going to take a hit when she drowns in student loan debt. Chuck asks her to talk over some coffee which looks fairly inappropriate out of context. Good thing the woman that created a mini downpour and flew away in front of a dozen witnesses doesn't have anyone out looking for her right now. She agrees to the chat, but we go to either later that night or possibly another night entirely, where the prof is at his pal Eric Lencher's place. I'm rather perplexed by the sculpture over his fireplace. Its only real significance is foreshadowing his helmet's inner frame, so to me it kind of looks weird here. Anyway, as a maid pours their drinks, Eric wants to meet this new mutant, and we get the usual argument between these two, humanity inherently fearing homo superior, a term which Charles really doesn't like, versus the hope that proper education will lead to acceptance. Good luck for all the portions of humanity where morons in power are trying to prevent people from getting educated. I'm sorry, I seem to have let some real life seep into my silly little comic review show for some reason. Moving on... 
Eric plays a show he had taped earlier, featuring footage from Canada, where Logan has been put in a literal cage and forced to fight a bear. We don't get much of the fight, but the announcers of America's Most Violent Videos are quick to call attention to the wild man's claws when they come out, so all the nation can make sure to see them. After that match, 24 armed men took Logan into custody, which the Master of Magnetism feels illustrates his cynical point, as Charles leaves to rescue the mutant. Bringing in Lyncher's signature helmet, the maid is revealed to be Mystique, whom Eric chose not to tell his old friend about just yet. You just know he's going to ask whose idea it was that she parade around like a saucy anime maid, and things will get real awkward real quickly. So it does make me wonder, who does he think that maid is? If he doesn't suspect that she's a mutant, and he must think that Eric has a human maid that he's perfectly comfortable talking about mutant stuff around. Maybe the stress from being so confused about this is why he's gone bald. Sometime later, the prof has explained to Aurora his tense friendship with Eric. I always say, an enemy is just a friend who's trying to kill you. I guess they're in a university lab, but look at that building. The entrance alone takes up more than half its height. Did Chuck build his own private but tiny lab? Because it looks like there are just two rooms on the second floor. He figures if he can get the wild man to accept himself, he'll change his life, and maybe even convince Magnus that there needn't be hostilities between mutants and humans. He presents his prototype Cerebro, designed to detect the X-Gene, but it requires so much power, it might raise suspicions from the university. If you've taken an attractive grad student into your weirdly small science lab, and they still haven't started asking questions, I think you're safe. Does this machine run on electricity? No, it runs on dreaming puppy dogs and hamsters running on wheels. Of course it runs on electricity! I thought you lived at a school. Aurora then charges the thing up, which, on the surface, seems like it'd work, but also could either short out the machine or devices in the area, or even the power grid. But there I go, getting all realistic again. Weird that I do that when I'm a cartoon now. Emulating the original X-Men films, wisps of psychic images zip by Chuck until he locates Logan, signified by him busting through a wall. The software for the location algorithm is set to Kool-Aid Man. Indeed, the Knucklehead cut his way out of his cell and took off, with pursuing officers sent in the opposite direction thanks to Mystique disguised as a homeless man. Aurora intercepts the clawed stranger, whose first instinct is to cut a telephone pole so it would fall down on her, but she generates enough wind to deflect it. Meaning him no harm, she lands and says she's here to help on behalf of Charles Xavier. Wow, internships at this university are quick and require no paperwork whatsoever, apparently. But Logan is skeptical, as he doesn't remember anything before waking up in a snowbank. Which means that was one heck of a bachelor party! Charles projects an astral image of himself to offer aid in helping Logan explore his gifts and even fit in with society. And I guess this is visible and audible to anyone in the area, as Magneto chimes in, clearly having heard all that. Not sure if this is one of the iterations where Magnus's helmet can block psionic abilities or not, but oh well. Mags asks why Logan would want to fit into a society that considers him a freak of nature. Just because your hair was blonde when you were young, but became darker as an adult. Uh, wait, are you not the 20-something co-ed Charles talked to earlier? You're not a freak. You're beautiful. You are the future. Are you coming on to me? Hot crackers, I take exception to that. I'm not hearing a no. He offers the claw guy a chance to join him in this next step of human evolution, and that's when Charles reminds us he's a professor, citing previous stages of humanity that evolved without attacking its heralds, that humans and mutants can coexist. From Australopithecus to Homo habilis, from Homo erectus to Neanderthal, and then to Homo sapien. Nerd! Magneto warns that when more mutants start popping up, conflict with non-powered humans is inevitable, and Logan realizes he's being asked to pick either war or peace. Wars, however, are ugly, and Logan is all for avoiding them, so rejects Tinhead's offer, knowing enough about himself to feel assured he's no better than anyone else. I don't know, I could lift off some names of people I think that the grizzled berserker rage beast that's offed a few people in his time is still a better person than by comparison, but I digress. He's got just enough amnesia to not remember much of anything before the last several days, but enough to be certain that he's morally upright. 
It's almost convenient, but I guess he may have certain instincts despite the memory loss to help make his choice. Eric congratulates Charles on another recruit, but asks, what is he building if not an army? A franchise! A year later, the X-Jet lands into the secret hangar of the Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters, a sign indicating enrollment starts soon. Wolverine and Storm have stopped Magneto from hijacking some missiles, but he got away, possibly to create a reference for another story from the older X-Comics, which is exactly why you X-Men are necessary, to help combat Magneto's more... extreme measures. The 90s are over. Making everything extreme has become passé, and it's high time Magnus learned to move past outdated media trends. Wolvie says they'll be ready next time Mag starts trouble, and how great the new school looks, but he has this grumpy expression, like maybe he didn't get to slash enough people on this mission. Oh, okay. Then I guess just pout. Or maybe he's just bummed Magneto got away. Storm agrees that the School for Mutants to learn to control their powers and work within society will be an excellent counterpoint to Magneto's ideology. The comic ends on the upgraded Cerebro finding their first student. Scott Summers, seen here optic blasting something off screen. Hey, if I had his powers, I'd probably open fire on every mosquito I saw too. The story was a good look at how Charles was inspired to start a School for Mutants, having mentioned a couple of times the importance of education to guide understanding. That aside from him just being a teacher, though it doesn't exactly get into how he affords to start his own halls of academia. Previous media have established that it's his personal property and he comes from money, and I don't think the 90s cartoon ever really got into his family's wealth either, at least not for a couple of seasons, so this is still kind of a minor gripe, with a very slim chance that anyone not familiar with other continuities might be scratching their heads. One might question Wolverine, the gruff guy with anger issues who's usually up for a fight, deciding against war. Even to me, it seemed a bit off. At first. Logan usually fights to defend himself or others, when he's pushed too far. It's not that he necessarily wants to fight, but that he ends up in situations where his or someone else's survival depends on him not only fighting, but winning. That and the whole personal trauma. War is much bigger, messier, more devastating ugly, like he said. It's a bit glib, considering his memory problems, but it works. Storm is fine, though it almost seems very easy to sway her to Charles' side. Not that she's shown much reason to pick Magneto, but she saves a guy with her powers in broad daylight, and yes, it's still weird that even later no one is crowding her or asking about her. She gets some exposition about the prof's mutation theory and his frenemy's pessimistic view of humans, and kind of goes along with it. She's helpful, no doubt, but it doesn't delve into why she wants to help or be part of a bigger mission like the X-Men, only that she used to be worshipped before attending the university. Gotta wonder how it looked on her transcript when her extracurricular activities included being considered a deity. The art clearly takes heavy influence from anime and manga, which really kicked off in popularity in America around this time. Mixing U.S. intellectual properties with Japanese aesthetics became very trendy. This was back when anime was still pretty niche, not quite as commonplace or mainstream as it's become today. It looks great, despite that weird lab building, but there's something about the focal characters that makes them feel slightly different to me compared to the other nameless people. The latter seem straight up more manga style, whereas our mutant characters, while seeming the same, are kind of tweaked to more closely resemble their animated counterparts. I don't know, maybe I can't articulate it well, but again, I don't have any complaints there. The writing so far is fine, but I did notice a few sentence or sentence fragments starting with lower case letters after periods rather than being capitalized, and a my DNA error, but no big deal. It could also be considered a little deceptive to feature the first season's roster on the cover, despite only 40% of them actually appearing in the book. 50 if you want to be really generous and count Scott at the screen at the very end. But I think it could be forgiven because it's to distinguish its connection to the show, and all these characters together would be the most notable and recognizable. Alternatively, I guess they could have had something like Storm and Wolverine fighting Magneto in a scene involving missiles, kind of a little hint at the adventure mentioned at the end, but the cover they went with does have more first-issue flair to it. Next time, we check out how the destined leader of the X-Men acclimates to using his powers for good, instead of ruining eye exam charts. I'm the Angry Spork, and man, have I got issues. Thank you.